All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this virtual version of our Alumni Ancestry Exploration event. I'm Audrey Tierney, the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement, and I am so pleased to be joined today by Linda Lauer, who will be moderating the program, and a special guest, Dennis P. Wodzinski, who will be sharing his expertise on how to use Catholic sacramental records to document family history. Also joining us is our Assistant Vice President of Alumni Engagement, Sarah Sperry, who will be helping to run the technical end of the program. Before I introduce Linda, I have just a few notes in regards to the session. Throughout the program, your microphones will be muted, but you are welcome at any time to submit questions through the chat feature found on the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. Following Dennis's presentation, we will open up the floor so that you can ask any questions you might have. At this time, we will answer any pre-submitted questions that weren't covered during the program. Those that you enter into the chat, or you can click at, on the raise your hand button found in the same toolbar at the bottom of the screen. If you raise your hand, we will unmute you to enable you to ask your question at that time. Linda will ask as many questions as possible during the hour and a half allotted for this session. And we'll be sure to remind you of those options once we reach that part of the program. Now to introduce our moderator. Our students know Linda Lauer as the Assistant Director for Internships and Experiential Education in the Center for Career Development. But what they might not know is that Linda has always been interested in genealogy and history. She grew up in a family that admired their ancestors, shared stories, and met annually at family reunions. Her family also saved and passed down heirlooms and stuff. Linda is the recipient of much of this stuff. She has recorded the stories she heard as a child, videotaped family members reminiscing about their childhood, and trudged through many, many cemeteries in search of ancestors and family stories. She is the president of the North Hills Geneal Genealogist and is a member of the Western PA Genealogical Society and the Western New York Genealogical Society. She also appears periodically on KDKA TV's Pittsburgh Today Live with Rich Venezia, a professional genealogist, and is on the conference committee for the North Hills Genealogist. You may also recognize Linda from our past alumni ancestry events. She was a big help in reaching out to our special guest today as well. Thank you, Linda, for serving as our moderator today. I'll turn the program over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Audrey. I'm really happy to be involved in today's program. Dennis has done a previous presentation for the North Hills Genealogist, probably more than one, and I thought Duquesne alumni and friends would appreciate hearing his presentation as well. So Dennis Wodzinski is the Director of the Archives and Records Center of the Catholic Diocese of Pittsburgh. He holds a BA in History from John Carroll University and an MA in History from Duquesne University's Archives and Museum Studies Program. Prior to his employment with the Diocese of Pittsburgh, he served as archivist for the Sisters of St. Francis of the Providence of God and archivist and curator for the Catholic Diocese of Greensburg. Dennis presently is on the board of directors for the Catholic Historical Society of Western Pennsylvania. And previously, he served as an adjunct instructor in the History and Classics Department of Duquesne and La Roche University. Dennis, I'm really looking forward to learning more about the information and records available from the Catholic Archival Collections. And I'll join you after the presentation for our Q&A portion of the evening. And I'm turning it over to you, Dennis. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. And also thank you to Audrey and Sarah for helping orchestrate this event. It's a great honor to be with everyone today. As you see on my title, I'm a graduate of the Liberal Arts Graduate School from 06. Um, I'm, I'm a proud Duquesne graduate, and I don't think I'd be where I am today without my Duquesne education, uh, speaking professionally, but also uh, spiritually. Um, to be working at, as the archivist for the Diocese of Pittsburgh, I think uh, the Spiritans had a certain element to, to that development as well. So it's very, it's a great honor to be with you today. So my talk today is called Finding the Faith, Using Diocesan and Sacramental Records to Document Family History. So the focus today for budding genealogists out there and genealogists is basically to showcase what we can share with you 
as uh, Catholic diocesan archives and specifically what we can share with you here in Pittsburgh. So I'll give you both a little study into what we have in Pittsburgh and what you can expect to find perhaps in other dioceses around the country. So a little background before I get into the, the crux of the, the talk, the it's here, sorry. Apologize, sir. Um, in regards to the size of the Archives and Records Center for the Diocese of Pittsburgh, we would probably be considered about a mid-size archival collection. You look at the archdioceses of Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, their collections are a little bit bigger than ours. We're in the mid-range. If you're looking at cubic feet, we have about 8,700 cubic feet on our shelves right now. We have a four-person full-time staff, and I'm proud to say we have three archivists on staff. All three of us have graduated from Duquesne's program. So all of us are, are Duquesne grads, myself, the director, and the prior director, um, Ken White, was a Duquesne guy, and Sophia Olson graduated perhaps a couple years ago from the program. So we have strong Duquesne ties here at the uh, Diocese of Pittsburgh Archives and Records Center. Actually, another tie, it's, it's important to note, the archivist for Duquesne University, uh, Tom White, uh, did his internship here. So uh, it's, a, it's a great connection we have with Duquesne and we're quite proud to do, uh, share with you today. We also are aided at the Archives and Records Center by 10 volunteers. And these are the volunteers who are largely gonna be doing our genealogy work for us. And we stress that that number is fluid because we find ourselves in the times of COVID. Uh, as most of our volunteers, as you can imagine, are retirees, we are kind of limiting their numbers on site. Uh, so we are a bit flexible in our work time, at the, as you can imagine. You can expect to find a lot of information here at the Archives and Records Center. Uh, a lot of people come here to research parish histories, um, perhaps Catholic organizations in Western Pennsylvania. We have files on 423 parishes in our diocese. Um, at one point, we had 323 active at one point. Now we're down to around 100. So we are gradually uh, changing in our shape and I'll get a little bit into that perhaps. But you can uh, find a little bit of everything here regarding the Catholic faith in Western Pennsylvania at the Archives and Records Center. And just to orient you, uh, we are in, where I'm presenting is the re public research area. So if it was not during the time of COVID, uh, it'd be, uh, uh, you would be able to walk in and do some research here, but right now we are limiting uh, visitors at this time. Uh, of most importance, right now we have about 6,500 sacramental books in our holdings at the diocesan archives. I would state we have the most sacramental books in an archive in North America. And I would, I would state that very uh, forcefully because we have a very aggressive collections policy right now. In the 27, or 2020, uh, calendar year, our increase of collections was around 27%. And why um, are we aggressively collecting so much? Because the diocese is in a reorganization phase at this point, as you might imagine. So all of our 140 some parishes are reorganizing and we're going to get down to a number of about 50 parishes. So diocesan policy, if something merges or closes, the records come here. So when in effect everything closes and merges, we're getting a lot of information. So that's why we have so many records here currently at the Archives and Records Center. So we do genealogy work here, but also if you're baptized at a parish, perhaps even within the last 20 years, we would have your records. So if you ever need documentation, you might see my autograph on, on some of those records. Now let's get a little bit into really the crux of what we wanna talk about. I'd mentioned we have parish drop files, we have parish histories, we have great collections of photographs. Uh, some parishes have great collections. You can see an image of the St. Michael Southside school band from the 1940s. St. Michael has a great collection. It just, um, it, it was always, it was basically up to the people running the show, whether they maintained records or not. And St. Michael's one of those parishes where we have a great amount of information but I'm gonna focus on our topic is genealogy and we're gonna focus on parish sacramental books today and what you can kind of get from that information found in those books and how to go about that work. Let's go into the title of a parish sacramental record. So first of all, what is a parish? Uh, I know I'm talking to uh, alums of a Catholic university, but it's important we kind of understand our terms. In the Code of Canon Law, I'll talk about Canon Law in a minute. Canon Law 15, 515 says basically a parish is a certain community of Christian faithful, faithful, stably constituted in a particular church whose pastoral care is entrusted to a pastor under the authority of the diocesan bishop. So those are some key factors in what establishes a parish. So stability is very important. 
Oftentimes around the early 1900s, you saw communities of workers springing up and parishes were established because a growing number of Catholic faithful in a particular area. The diocesan bishop would allow this parish to be established and he would assign a pastor, a priest to take care of their spiritual needs. And that's largely uh, where a lot of parishes were established. Uh, you need stability, you need a, a community that will be there through the years, you need the authority of the bishop, and you need uh, basically a shepherd of that flock. You need a pastor assigned to it. Another key component of a parish is territory. Every parish in the Diocese of Pittsburgh has physical boundaries. The key is basically, the idea is if you're living in a particular area, you know where you are to receive the sacraments or you know who is there to help you in your spiritual development. So if you lived uh, down the street from Duquesne, you probably would have gone to Epiphany or uh, I grew up in Emsworth or I grew up in Ben Avon, Pennsylvania. So I went to Sacred Heart, Emsworth. So territory is very important in establishing the, uh, the rule of a parish in a particular area. Canon law, I'm gonna throw that around a couple of times. Canon law is simply put, are basically the governing laws of the Catholic church. It's not civil law, it's laws about maybe how the sacraments are administered, how to establish a parish and basically the norms, the governing norms of the Catholic church. That's the simplest way to keep it. And so that's largely what I mean when I say canon law. So when I talk about parishes, I often just look at Sharpsburg, Pennsylvania uh, to orient yourself. Sharpsburg is Northeast of Pittsburgh. Uh, you can see the Allegheny River on the right center of the screen. You can see Route 28 on the left center of the screen and Route 8 going uh, to the uh, left of the screen going north towards Butler. Basically within those boundaries is the main part of Sharpsburg, Pennsylvania. This is a good case study of, of parish establishment. So you would say in the early 1800s, Sharpsburg starts to be inhabited. By the 1840s, we see heavy industry in that area. So there's a growing number of Catholics in the Sharpsburg area and they petitioned the bishop. So in 1840s, the parish of St. Joseph Sharpsburg is established in 1845 as what we call the territorial parish. So anybody living within those territorial boundaries belong to St. Joseph's in Sharpsburg. Now we see immigration occurring in the mid 1800s. A great number of Germans are moving into the area. So the diocesan bishop realizes that a specific church is needed for the German population of Sharpsburg. So in the 1850s, in 1852, St. Mary Parish in Sharpsburg is established. So if you're traveling up Route 28 today, you can still see the beautiful spires of St. Mary's on your right as you're traversing uh, north out of the city. So St. Mary's is established as an ethnic parish. The idea is Germans living in the area should attend this parish because of fraternal concerns and basically to promote unity in the faithful of the German ethnicity. So you start to see more and more immigration trends. By the turn of the century, you start to see an Italian wave. So in 1904, another parish is established within Sharpsburg, Madonna of Jerusalem, which was an Italian parish. So we have three churches right in the small area. Uh, to orient you again, St. Joseph's being the territorial parish for English speakers, now we have two ethnic parishes, St. Mary's and Madonna. And within a couple of years, another church is established. St. John Cantius was established because of a growing Polish population. So you have three of these parishes established for purely ethnic reasons, and you have the territorial parish of St. Joseph. Now I stress this because this is very important when de doing genealogical work. If you have a person living within a stone's throw of St. Mary's parish, but they are English speaking, they probably did not go to that church. They would have traveled across town to go to St. Joseph's, the English speaking parish. Likewise, if someone lived close to St. Joseph's but spoke Polish, they would not have gone to that church. They would have traveled a little further to go to St. John Cantius. So this is very important in understanding research in genealogy. One, understanding where people live. So there's the idea of territorial parishes, but also if they had an ethnic background, perhaps they went to a specific church. And that is why Sharpsburg is such a great case study. It's a, it's a fascinating look into Catholicism in Western Pennsylvania. I went to a wedding at St. Mary's and if basically stand in the parking lot of St. Mary's, you can see St. John Cantius on the other block. I mean, so it's just a, it's a fascinating landscape around the early 1900s when so many of these ethnic parishes were shooting up. And that all changes. And now in 2009, all these parishes were once again consolidated under the title of St. Juan Diego Parish. So that is now the territorial parish 
and these ethnic parishes have uh, ceased to exist in that regard. So we are in a state of flux at the diocese, but uh, the understanding of when parishes are established, their boundaries, their ethnic components are important to note when doing genealogical work. So parishes, what is a sacrament? So very simple. Again, the seven sacraments touch all the stages of the important moments of Christian life. They give birth and increase healing and mission to the Christian's life of faith. So we have the seven sacraments of baptism, penance, first communion, confirmation, matrimony, holy orders, and anointing of the sick. Now, I was married at Duquesne, and Father Hogan, I think in a lot of his, his uh, wedding homilies, he mentions that the sacraments are the hinge point in one's life. And I think that's a beautiful way to look at these moments, these changes in your life. So that's kind of what the sacraments highlight, these changes in your faith development. And so we have books that document these, these important moments in life. So we have these, what we call sacramental registers, and it's the key of today's uh, talk. Parish record keeping 101, these are all from canon law. These are laws of the Catholic Church. It states that in each parish there are to be parochial registers, that of baptism, marriage, and deaths, and any other registers prescribed by the conference or by the diocesan bishop. The parish priest is to ensure the entries are accurately made and that registers are carefully preserved. So canon law says we need three books. So we need baptismal books, we need marriage books, and we need death books. And it's up to the bishop if we need anything else. And in Pittsburgh, we also maintain a first communion book and a confirmation book. Number two, very important for our study of genealogy. Any event which affects a person's canonical status is always recorded in the baptismal book. So what does that mean? Canonical status basically means as you advance in the sacraments, an update should always be placed in the baptismal book. I was baptized at Sacred Heart Emsworth. Um, I was confirmed at Assumption. So the idea is Assumption should send an update to Sacred Heart that I was confirmed and that would be reflected on my baptismal book. I was married at Duquesne University. Uh, an update should have been sent back to Sacred Heart that I was married. So whenever something changes in one's sacramental life, that update should be reflected in the baptismal book. Obviously, that's very important for genealogy because you can often learn a lot by a person by just looking at their baptismal record. You can see if they were married and whatnot. So that's very important. Another important component, parishes are only able to maintain sacramental registers and us at the Archives and Records Center. So what does that mean? It's not as simple as you might think. So parishes, parish territorial boundaries are the only people, only organizations that allowed to maintain books. What, do you, what happens when you have Heinz Chapel or Duquesne University Chapel? They're not parishes. Again, sacramental records are entrusted to the parish of the territory. So I was married at Duquesne University Chapel. Where are my records? Uh, if we were all unmuted, I'd take questions. But my records, my marriage records, and perhaps many of your records are just down the hill or were just down the hill at Epiphany. Uh, since Epiphany is the territorial parish of this area of uptown. That's where all the marriage records from Duquesne were stored. Now I say were because, Duke, uh, because Epiphany has merged. So all those records presently now are at the archives and record center behind me. So we have those records now, but the idea is that parishes are the only ones entrusted to maintain sacramental books. And that's why if you get married at Duquesne now, they are still maintained downtown, but the parish has a new title of divine mercy. So that's uh, just an, an interesting thing to keep in mind. So what types of books do we maintain? We maintain books for all the five uh, sacraments that I outlined, baptism, first communion, confirmation, marriage, and death. I highlighted the books that yield the most genealogical information. Baptism, marriage, and death yield the most information if you are doing genealogical work. And we'll go into a little bit of all of these. I wanna emphasize in regards to the relation to books and certificates. We often get requests here that I need my original baptismal certificate. One thing, there's no such thing. The original record is actually the book. So the original record is what we write into that sacramental book. When you need a, a certificate, we'll open the book up and we'll write exactly what is written in that book and we'll affix a raised seal to it to say that we have verified this information is true. Now that is why today you need to produce a baptismal record within six months of you getting married because the priest wants to see one, you're baptized, two, that you are confirmed, and so that update should be on there, and three, that you weren't married prior or that if you had an annulment. So that's why uh, you always are asked to produce a recent baptismal certificate uh, in modern times. 
So let's look at the registers in particular. The baptismal one is the most important. What can you gain from a baptismal register record? The information on the person's birth date, their birth location, their parents' names, including the mother's maiden name, which is very important for us as genealogists, and usually information on godparents. This is the record that typically produces the most genealogical information. Um, as mentioned, notations can also list subsequent marriages, et cetera. So that can yield certain information. Typically for genealogy, speaking uh, across the country, excuse me, information is restricted to usually records of 100 years or older. Here at the diocese, we maintain that as well. But we can say if the person has been deceased, we can open up records 70 years in order. So if someone was born in the 1930s, but that you can prove their death, we can open up that record as well for you. So that is the rules that we maintain across the board for all our sacramental records. So let's look at a few examples. Our earliest parish in the Diocese of Pittsburgh, this is St. Patrick's in the Strip District. We see a baptismal register from 1818. What can you see here? So that's why we train our genealogists to look for appropriate information. It's very helpful if you went to the classics department at Duquesne for Latin, uh, maybe taught by Lawrence Gatius, but uh, it's Latin's very important to our studies here because you could see, let's look at this case here. So the year is 1818, the date, we're looking at July, Juli 12th. So this person is baptized July, July 12th. Nicholas McCartney, I believe, born on the fifth day of this month, son of Jacobi, Jacobi, and Johanna. So one thing I stress is we always translate these as written. So you see Jacobi or Jacobus. We definitely keep that in the original Latin because Jacobus can be translated two ways. Obviously it's always Jacob or it could be James. So we don't, we leave it in the Latin. There is no Latin version of James. That's why in the 1700s there was a revolt in Great Britain, the Jacobite Rebellion, it wasn't because of a guy named Jacob, it was because of a king named James. And that's why we call it the Jacobite Rebellion. So that is produced. There's also godparents listed as well. So this record, the older records, though great, don't yield the most amount of information. You could see highlighted what's listed here. The date of the baptism, the 12th of July, the name of the baptized, the date of the birth, fifth of this month, the name of the parents, and the names of the sponsors. With time, we start to see more information. So we go a little closer to home here. This is the baptismal record of my grandfather, Charles Kunzler. This is a great record, actually. He was baptized at St. Boniface Parish on the north side, that great, beautiful church with a dome as you uh, traverse up and down 279. So let's go through what can be found on his record. We can see that his name is listed as Charles Martin Kunzler, born Natum, November 1st, 1915. Baptized November 7, 1915. It provides the address of where his family was living, 408 Katoma Street, which for Northsiders, that is fine view. Father George Kunzler from Bel Air, Ohio, and Carolina Heil of Allegheny, PA. Godparents Charles Kunzler and Uxer Eus, his wife Stella, and the name below being the priest. So some great information there. I'm going to point out that that line ex loco, basically where they're from, can be changed. Sometimes it's going to list the street name. Sometimes it's going to list the family was from Poland. Sometimes it's going to list very nothing. So it depends who is maintaining the record. Let's go to another family record here. You'll see this is in McKeesport. Oh, excuse me. This is actually from my aunt, who I never met, Eileen Wodzinski. She died tragically in a, a uh, sledding accident when she was a youth. But this is her baptismal record. Uh, you could see she was born not Tom, uh, April 6, 1937, from Anthony, who was from McKeesport, and Veronica Sabachinsky from McKeesport. Now, I know these records, they are not from McKeesport. Anthony was actually from Poland, and Veronica grew up in Westmoreland County. So in this way, they're interpreting where they are presently living. So that can be misleading sometimes. It will also list godparents and the priest. This is a, a unique record in many ways. If you know the landscape of McKeesport, the Catholic landscape, uh, it's very telling here. This is St. Perpetua Parish. This was the Italian parish in McKeesport, but you have this Polish family getting their baptisms here. 
the, the family story is, and genealogy often produces great stories, is that my grandmother did not get along with the pastor at the Polish uh, church at the time. So she went to Father Pietro Rossi and said, I need my children baptized. Eventually, the children went to St. Mary Częstochowa, but that, that took some convincing for some, for some reason. I'm not entirely sure, but a, a unique story there. So baptismal records produce a lot of great information. We'll come back to that. First communion registers only occasionally produce uh, location of baptism. Our current records do that, but in the case of genealogy, you're not going to find much on these older first communion books. It might list the parents' names, but generally these older books do not. There is little genealogical value to early first communion records. It's generally not worth the money uh, that's involved in the cost of the search. Again, information for these records is restricted to 100 years older, access to the records uh, 70 years and older if death is proven. So let's look at some of these first communion records. So this is a first communion book from Corpus Christi Parish, East Liberty. As mentioned, all it is is going to do is list who received first communion. So it's the the gentlemen and the gentlewomen's or uh, ladies and gentlemen's names are listed there, and that's it. And I'll tell you the date that they received first communion. But in regards to genealogical value, there's very little. Likewise with a confirmation register, there's not too much that you'll find in these older confirmation books. Occasionally, a baptism might be listed, but that's something we only start to do in modern times. Occasionally, the sponsor is listed. And like First Communion books, there's very little genealogical information to be found. Uh, the one instance, one or two instances where this is not true, it has been beneficial is in regards to a name. In a few instances, people have wondered why their grandparents or when they got this new name is because you take a name when you get confirmed. And sometimes we have traced that new middle name to the confirmation. So you'll see a confirmation register entry here. This is from St. Paul Cathedral. Again, you're not getting too much genealogical information, but we see that, oh, excuse me, that the name is listed of the children and the confirmation name is listed. So that possibly could be helpful, but again, you're not finding too much family history in these records. The next most important record after the baptismal book is the marriage register. Obviously, you're going to find the name of the couple, the groom and their bride, along with their surnames. The maiden name is included. Where the couple is from is included, but that could be interpreted various ways. That could list the parish, that could list the street, that could list the country of origin, or it could be left blank. Um, it depends who's maintaining the records, and that's, uh, that's sometimes it's hit and miss. Usually the names of the parents are listed and the sponsors and witnesses. And there's usually information on dispensations, annulments, uh, subsequent annulments. And again, this information is restricted to 100 years and we allow that to be opened up at 70 years if death is proven. That is our policy here at the archive. So let's look at a few specific marriage registers again. Let's go to older books. This is St. Paul Cathedral in Pittsburgh. Again, some of these older records, they're beautiful to look at, or maybe not beautiful, they're interesting to look at, but they don't yield too much information. So you see this 1872 record, marriage on July 4th. There was married Thomas Luahan and Bridget Dillon. That's all they have on those two. And their witnesses, Michael Sullivan and Ellen Carney, or Caney, and that's it. That's all we have on that marriage record. Sometimes you might already have that information. Um, so that's something, uh, to be considered when you do this work. Let's look at my grandparents again. In 1940, my grandparents, Charles Kunzler and Santina Berry were married. Charles Kunzler being of German descent and Santina Berry being of Italian descent. In 1940, Charles was working as a delivery boy or delivery man for a butcher. And Santina Berry was working as a, a uh, basically as a nanny. So I, my question is where would they have gotten married? Uh, some would say, on the north side of St. Boniface, where Charles was from, some would say uh, St. Peter downtown. That was an Italian parish. Perhaps that's where Santino Berry was married. Let's just say we don't know where they're married. So let's go back to Charles Kunzler's baptismal record. So uh, this is the baptismal record we saw before, but on that notation field on the right, if you can see it, it says married Santina Berry, 9940 at Our Lady of Lords in Burgettstown, Pennsylvania. So uh, completely different part of Western PA. So they are married in West, uh, in uh, Washington County, uh, Burgettstown. So why were they married there? The important fact is that's where Santina Berry was from. So that is where my grandmother basically grew up. And that's where 
uh, they are married. So oftentimes in genealogical research, it's not where they are living, but oftentimes where the bride was from. Uh, so that's a factor to keep in mind. This is their marriage record. This is my grandparents' marriage record. Another great record. Uh, it's not always like this, so keep that in mind. So we have Carolum M. Kunzler, which is Charles in Latin. Ex loco, it's great. It has his, it says from St. Boniface, north side, it lists his birth date and his baptismal date. Son of Georgie E. K., George Kunzler and Carolina Heil, and Santina Berry, the bride from Burgettstown, Pennsylvania. A great fact I didn't know, but I believe my mother did, but it says she was baptized in Steubenville, Ohio, which, which was new to me. Daughter of Aunt Tony E. Berry and Catherine Delpini, and the witnesses of Paulo Nosek and Teresa Berry, and the priest's name is listed there. So a great record, I locked out there. And it's fantastic, again, genealogy helps out because it visualizes things. So this photograph was taken the day that they got married. And obviously the stars of the show are my grandparents, but if it wasn't for my mother, I don't believe I would have known who was on the right side. That is my great aunt Tracy, my mother's aunt Tracy, and Paulo Nosek. I don't know who that fellow is, but I'm sure he has a story to tell. He's the fellow on the left, my grandfather's best man. So uh, uh, again, genealogy, uh, Sacramento records kind of provide a little more information than uh, the, the image uh, initially provides us with. So that's important to keep in mind. I, I always stress too, I mean, godparents, um, bridesmaids, they're not the records you're looking for, but oftentimes they could hint towards the families that they're traveling with, where these people were from Italy or from Germany, if they came over together. So they can elaborate on the Italian community that where they were from or the German community. So uh, keep those in mind as you're undertaking your, uh, your genealogical work. Now, I wanna stress looking at other marriage records, this is all from one parish in the 1890s, St. Peter's Parish in the uptown neighborhood of Pittsburgh. If you're at Duquesne University, you could probably see where this church once stood. Uh, it stood up until the 1960s. It is basically where Chatham Center is in kind of when Pittsburgh went through a regional development, uh, St. Peter's was raised. Uh, it was a beautiful building, but it was just the, the nature of progress at the time. St. Peter has the distinction of being the first Italian parish in the Diocese of Pittsburgh. So you have a lot of Italian records here in St. Peter's. Rich Venezia, the great genealogist, often asks for records from this parish because he specializes in Italian genealogy. So let's look at this great record. I'm stressing with these three records from the same parish in the same decade how you can lock out with things and you can, uh, you can not find anything. So this is a marriage record of two individuals, Joseph, um, again, Latin, Celentano, uh, about 20 years old in Latin from Bel Basilicata, Italia. So it gives you a region, gives you town where he's from, tells you his parents. He married Lucium, Lucia Caruso Annuorum Viginti Unum. She is 21. And it says where she is from. And I believe actually in hindsight that this tells you a parish, San Pietri in Cosenza, Italia. So it tells you where they're from. Great, great record here. Uh, Joseph Molinari, the priest, kept great records. Let's go to another marriage within this decade at the same parish. Father Ludovic was not a great record keeper. You can see this marriage. He lists they're from Italy. Okay, let's, let's start our search. Let's go to Rome, start looking for these people. Uh, so it's often up times to the, the, the uh, person keeping the record. And the third horrible example is Father Sixtus he basically lists Luigi and Jacinta got married, doesn't say where they're from, doesn't say who their parents are. So no information really for us as genealogists. It's a nice record, but it's not as great as that one we saw a few pages ago. So that's sometimes the luck of the draw. Another instance you'll see, I uh, get questions about spellings. And this is a great example here. This is a from St. Nicholas Parish on the north side, one of the great Croatian parishes of North America. And this was found out by one of our volunteers, Bob Buckler, one of our genealogists. And he came up to me, he says, Dennis, where is this person from? It says Lickdale. There is no Lickdale in Western Pennsylvania. I was like, well, maybe it's a town in Croatia. I was like, maybe. So then he went back and he also noticed a Biver Falls in Fridham. And we realized that these are actually very close by places as Beaver Falls, Leetsdale. Lickdale is Leetsdale in Freedom. So, that's something you face uh, doing this work. Um, I don't know what the scenario was, whether the priest didn't know the area, 
Uh, we've had instances where there was Irish priests assigned to Italian parishes and obviously writing down records was not the, the greatest job of an Irishman interpreting the language of the Italian. So you get these problems and these are scenarios that we often find as genealogists. So sometimes writing is a trick, but uh, is, a, is a problem, but that's sometimes the nature of what we find. I know in my grandfather's, uh, my great grandfather's record, we often find different spellings. Let's look at death registers. Sometimes this can yield some information. Uh, a death register is a bit of a misnomer. A death register is really a funeral register. Uh, so if you had a funeral at a specific parish, uh, you are listed in the death register. So you have to have had a funeral mass to be listed in these books. Occasionally the death register will list the person's birth date, their age, their next of kin, the cause of death. And usually where they're buried, sometimes a plot number is listed, but that's as specific as it will get. What's unique about death records, at least in the Diocese of Pittsburgh, there's no restriction to this. So if you wanted to research a, a death register from two years ago, we would provide you with that information. Uh, there's no restriction. Uh, we do not have cemetery records here. That is a little different. Uh, we have an organization called the Catholic Cemeteries Association of the Diocese of Pittsburgh, and they are actually across the parking lot from us. They have cemetery information. So if you want a specific plot, or um, a little bit more information about the burials, you would have to contact them. So let's look at what death information can be found. This is actually my great grandfather's death record. Uh, this is a state record. So this is something I, uh, you're not pulling this from the Catholic church. Uh, very tragic, uh, he was age 39, he died in a mining accident. Um, he was a widower at the time. So this is an extremely tragic event, event in my family's history because Mike Sabachinsky, a, a, a single father, leaves behind five children, the oldest being 11 years old at the time. So we'll get to that in a moment. But what the state record, the death record shows down below, shows us the place of burial, Saints Mary and Anna in Mariana, PA. You can see they are very inventive with that parish title. But that helped me track down where uh, my great-grandfather was buried. So I pulled out the Saints Mary and Anna in Mariana PA death book. You can see it has an entry here, Mike Sabachinsky, and they weren't sure how to spell his name. Obviously there was not an adult to really course uh, to elaborate on that, but his date of death is listed, his date of burial is listed, and the cemetery is listed as Saints Marian, and his age is listed, and the presiding priest is listed. So this narrowed down where he was buried to me. So I went to Saints Marian Ann in Mariana PA, and I went to the cemetery and actually what's close by is the former Mariana mine where he died. Uh, obviously I didn't go in, but it was kind of unique to be there and to go to Saints Mary and Anne Cemetery and half of the cemetery, it's just grass. As you imagine, many of these are miners who died in accidents, maybe not identified. But in the case of my great grandfather, again, you can imagine the pitiful scene it would have been to be there with uh, five children at the grave of their father, not really knowing of their future. So it's a unique landscape to me to be there, to know where my grandmother was at this very sorrowful moment. But we don't know where he's buried. It's not marked uh, as you know, as you can imagine with um, such a young family with no, with no parents. Uh, so his grave is unmarked. We're not fully sure where he is right at this point. But uh, that leads us into the next group of records that we have, orphanage records. We do here at the Diocese of Pittsburgh, and we could kind of point you out at other dioceses. We have records from St. Paul Orphanage and St. Joseph Orphanage. We also have entry and departure information for the Foley Family Institute of Emsworth. Orphanage records usually give us a child's name, the date of the admission, the day of the departure. Oftentimes that's it. Uh, sometimes there is information on their parents. Sometimes there is information on why they were sent to the orphanage and why they were sent home. So let's pick up um, the story of my, uh, my family. So at the Holy Family Institute, we have the orphanage admission book. We see the three Sabachinsky boys were admitted on March 7th, 1924. That's five months after their father died. Uh, so it, it provides uh, a unique framework for stories from my grandmother about how they lived for five months on their own. But you can see the unique information you find here, dates of birth, the date of uh, admission, the dates they were released from the orphanage and the release of or orphanage. 
The two youngest were sent to CCC camps and the oldest was sent uh, to live with my grandmother. So it kind of shows you when they went in and when they went out. Um, so sometimes that can be telling sometimes. I didn't know they went to CCC camps, so that's, uh, that's unique to me. So let's talk about some general hints about accessing uh, sacramental records. Uh, general hints, uh, records 100 years or older are open. Records 70 years or older uh, are available if death is proven. If the records are still at the parish, expect some pushback. Most parishes are not training staff to do genealogical work. Um, I will say here at the Diocese of Pittsburgh, we have collected all of the books. I mean, there really aren't any books out there that you would be doing genealogical work on. So we have all the records here. We are unique in that regard. So if you're going to a diocese like the Diocese of Erie, the Diocese of Greens Greensburg, you would probably have to contact the parish directly or the successor parishes. Keep in mind, most parish offices are understaffed or maintain limited hours. Um, so it, sometimes it's, it might take a couple emails, a couple calls to enable them to uh, uh, answer your requests. In regarding the location of records, uh, locations or the location is key. Um, we often get requests. Uh, my great grandfather was living in Pittsburgh. He went to St. Mary's in the 1980s or 1880s. One, Pittsburgh's a big city. Two, there's so many St. Mary's in the Diocese of Pittsburgh. Three, you, if you give us a decade, so narrow it down. So if you're doing research in Pittsburgh, if you're doing research with us, we ask that you know what neighborhood at least they were living in. Census data allows you to see addresses, so that helps out. Uh, so keep that in mind. Ethnicity is very important as well. Uh, in the example of Sharpsburg, uh, they might have been living close to a church building, but if, if they are of an ethnic background, sometimes they would have traveled several miles to get married at a particular church. And the great example yesterday, just yesterday, I had a gentleman call. He was asking about a St. Peter in Beaver County. He said his, his family was from Beaver County. I told him there's only one St. Peter in Beaver, it was St. Peter and Paul. That's the only one. And he told me on the marriage license that the priest was Italian. So right, right then, uh, it made me think downtown Pittsburgh, St. Peter's Italian parish. So it, it proved to be correct. So this family from Beaver County traveled to Pittsburgh to get married at the Italian parish. So that's, keep that in mind. Ethnicity is very important when doing uh, genealogical work, uh, finding these records or perhaps where these records were stored. And in the case of my, my grandparents, if doing mar marriage research, I understand where the bride grew up, because um, sometimes that might be where the marriage took place. And we still see that today. We get a lot of requests for baptismal records. And uh, I know a lot of the brides are getting married at where they grew up. Um, it'll be interesting in the years ahead. I know there'll be a lot of people saying I was married at Duquesne University. So that's, that'll be a different trend. We'll see 100 years from now, people going to the universities. I'll be stressing that. So we have two approaches when doing diocesan research, and this is outside of the Diocese of Pittsburgh. We have two approaches. So if you're working in the Erie Diocese or elsewhere, one approach, contact the diocesan chancery or the pastoral center and just ask for help. If they have an archivist, they can kind of point you in the right direction. Or if you know the town where these events occurred, if they occurred, uh, if they were baptized, married in a particular town, sometimes contact the current parish in the town. I worked in the Diocese of Greensburg. Um, all sacramental books of, of note are still in the field, so to speak. They're still at successor parishes. So if they're married in Connellsville, you would still contact the Connellsville area parishes. Um, so sometimes you have to kind of chart out the best approach to these, these, these requests. As mentioned in the Diocese of Pittsburgh, we have a centralized collection at the Archives and Records Center. So we're a one-stop shop uh, right now and, and in the future. If you wanna do work through the Archives and Records Center, we ask that you make a, a, a submission. We don't allow uh, outside researchers to go in and do the work themselves because one, the books are very fragile in many ways. So you might be very good at handling the books, but the next guy might not be. So we can't, we can't allow the general public to access these books. And two, very confidential information in these books. Some of these parishes have record books that span 100 years. So in one instance, in the first half of the book, the records might be open, 
but in the latter portion of the book, it might be records from the 1970s and 80s and still very active. So that's another reason why we only allow trained staff. Now, we, we, I always do this when doing a genealogy uh, presentation. We're always looking for assistance and help. So if this intrigues you, uh, we'd be glad for you to perhaps look to the future and volunteer with us. Uh, during this COVID time, we are not really looking. Uh, we're kind of spacing people out. But uh, if this is something that interests you, please do contact us in the future. Some more hints here. Uh, just uh, if you're doing work around the Diocese of Pittsburgh, the Diocese of Greensburg currently has no archivist. So if you're doing genealogical work, you would contact the parish, the successor parish itself. If you don't know what the successor parish is, you can call the Diocese of Greensburg Pastoral Center and they should be able to help you out there. If you go north to the Diocese of Erie, the biggest diocese in regards to space in Pennsylvania, they have a priest archivist, uh, but the sacramental records are still largely at the parishes. So you still have to do that uh, sleuthing. Perhaps you would contact him. He could help you out, but you're eventually going to have to contact the parishes themselves. The Di Diocese of Altoona, Johnstown, there's no current archivist. Sacramental books are still at the parishes, but there is a great resource that has been published called the Catholic Vital Records of Central Pennsylvania, which was published in 1994. This is an out of print book, but it has, uh, it's located in many uh, genealogical libraries. Um, it has records from the uh, 1799 to 1869 Catholic sacramental book records. So that is a resource you can look up. Moving to our west, the Wheeling Charleston Diocese has a professional lay archivist. The older books are at the archive, so it's similar to us. Um, so that's something you would contact them directly, the archivist, and he could help you out. Diocese of Steubenville, where our recently promoted Father David Bonner is now bishop. Uh, they have a professional lay archivist. Uh, the older books are at the, um, actually I got that wrong, but moving forward, uh, our, the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, Chicago, and New York um, are unique. They have great resources and certain sacramental books of their archdiocese are on findmypast.com. A lot of dioceses are considering uh, putting records online. We are still looking into this ourselves. We are not at that point right now. Honestly, our focus right now is with our on mission, uh, our reorganization uh, process of the diocese. So we're collecting records. We're still assessing how we're gonna present them. So it might be something in the future, but right now we're not looking at find my past or ancestry at this time. Uh, we know some dioceses are going that route and we're kind of in contact with some archivists. Some archivists are regretting some of their, their contracts. They're not regretting putting them out there, but they, uh, some, some of the things they wish they would have worked out better. So we're kind of keeping a tab on that. We aren't at that spot yet, but perhaps in the future. So just to take a look at the uh, Archives and Records Center, we have well over 6,800 uh, sacramental books. This is the interior of the vault, which you see behind me. Um, again, our records go back to the early 1800s, and these are the books uh, that we access the most uh, in our day-to-day -day operations. If you want to uh, research records from us, research is performed by trained staff and volunteers. So we do all the work, uh, we do the polling, we do the research. And as mentioned, Sacramento records older 100 years are open for genealogical research, but records between 70 years and 100 are open if death is proven. So what we offer is there is a form online that we have, uh, diopit.org backslash archives. Uh, you fill out the research request form with the appropriate information. We have a fee of $15 an hour. That's not per record. That's how much we can get to within an hour, which is quite a lot in many cases. So the idea is to formulate what you're looking for and then uh, present it to us. Uh, so. Uh, it's good, good money uh, in regards to the genealogical field. Uh, you still get a lot of information for $15. What you get as a result of the work is a transcription. So we type out what we have. Uh, we'll, we can email or mail it to you. And if you want an image of the record, we can send that to you for five additional dollars. So that, that is our fee schedule. That's how we do things at the Archives and Records Center at this moment. Again, the, the form can be found online. My, my uh, stress to you is be as specific as possible in regards to uh, dates, locations, et cetera, et cetera. So let's look at my uh, grandparents' marriage record again. So this is the record, and this is roughly what the transcription would be looking like. We would type it out like it is, and that would be largely, uh, the formatting might be a little different, but that's what we would present to you. 
and if you want an image, we can we can send the image to you as well. So I, I basically going to largely wrap up at this point. Uh, but if you visit diopit.org backslash archives, you can find our information there. There are a few resources on there at this moment. Um, our research request form is there. We do have a statement that on our website on the genealogy form that we are limiting research due to COVID. You can still submit a request, but that is up there basically telling you we're not as quick as we normally are because of basically we have to limit staffing on site. Um, we have a strong paid staff here, but there's a lot going on and we have to limit the number, number of people on site. So our genealogists uh, are limited when they're getting here. So it is saying we're not taking requests, um, but we will accept it if you submit it. Uh, this might be some time where you kind of mull over what you're looking for, kind of call me up maybe or email me and I can kind of guide you on uh, what you should submit. Um, so uh, that's that might be the time to kind of consider what to do. And as we emerge out of COVID, we will we'll be a little quicker in our response time. There's another important research, um, resource on our website. Uh, it's actually under important resources over there on the left. It's a PDF. It says Sacramento Records currently at the Archives and Records Center. So this, if you open it up, it'll tell you what records we have. It will say in Butler County, we have records from St. Peter from 1860 to uh, 1990. So it will list what records we have. So if you're looking for something, but you see that there's nothing at that location, obviously we won't be able to provide you with that. Uh, so that's a, a good thing to click on and look at as you're preparing your questions. Again, we have a great staff here at the Archives and Records Center. Um, Danette Alderson, she's our administrative assistant, uh, basically an archivist in her own right at this point. And we're also aided by Sue Hastings. She takes in a lot of the current uh, sacramental requests. And then us, the three archivists, uh, Ken and Sophia, we're all the Duquesne grads here. Uh, we're quite proud of what we do here. And um, we, we like sharing it. Uh, regrettably, uh, maybe in the future, we can have some of you on site, but uh, COVID, restricts at, the, at this point, but um, I think I'll wrap it up here. And I, I know we have some great questions uh, that we received and perhaps some tonight. So I'll, I'll go back to, I believe, Linda at this point. Um, thank you very much, Dennis. That was awesome. I knew that it would be, and I am sure that our participants are happy with all the information. It really is mind boggling. Everything that you know, I have to tell you <laughs> that. So, um, so there is going to, we have done a recording of this and those of you who are attended will receive in your email, um, the recording. So, um, so it's, it'll be good to go over all of that information again, I'm sure. So we're going to open up the floor now so that you can ask questions. Um, to ask your question verbally, please click on the raise your hand button that's found in the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. And we'll call on you and then unmute you um, so that you can ask your question. However, if you prefer to use the chat, um, the chat box, please do so. And we'll be um, we'll be um, going through those and um, and reviewing those to ask those questions as well. So while people are preparing, um, I am going to ask just a couple questions um, that were uh, sent in before the presentation. So one of the questions is, um, what information do I need to make an inquiry? Very good, very good question. So I kind of alluded to a few times, but um, we ask that you fill out the appropriate form. It's on diopit.org backslash archives. If, if, if you can't find it, you can email me. I believe my email is being shared, um, dwodzinski at diopit.org and archives at diopit.org if you have a question about that. But in regards to what we need, give us again, location. Again, Pittsburgh is a little too general at times. So if you know if they're living in Bloomfield, that's good information. If you have census data regarding where they were living at a particular time, that helps us out. Uh, again, ethnicity is very important, as well as that might tell us where they would have been. So if you're looking at Bloomfield and they're Italian, you're going to Immaculate Conception in Bloomfield and, uh, and so on. So location, um, a, a residence, a time frame, a limited time frame, 
uh, be as specific as you possible and uh, you'll best basically get more information that way. Okay, thank you. And then I know you talked a little bit about spelling, you know, like um, the the change or the confusion, I think, at times that can come from um, names. Can you just talk a little bit about that again? Absolutely. So um, with so many ethnicities coming anew into the to Pittsburgh or wherever, you're going to see some misspellings. Uh, I often say, is it the chicken or the egg? I mean, maybe our spelling today is wrong and perhaps the original spelling was correct, but you'll see names, uh, Italian names spaced out. Uh, Della Donna, I see as two words. I see Della Don, one word. Uh, Sabachinsky, my, my grandmother's family, it's a CH or it's a C. Uh, so you will see Mr. Elling, um, that is to be expected, but if you kind of know uh, the ethnicity, I know Polish, the CH would not have been appropriate, um, the, but the C would have been, uh, but you will encounter that certainly in these records. Okay, doke. And then, um, you know, I, I have to just, just respond to that. And uh, I like what you said about maybe today we're actually spelling the names wrong. I thought that is a, that's a good re good remark there, a good reminder actually, so that we know that we're not always we're not always right today. So, um, here's a question: um, My mother was raised in a Catholic orphanage in Erie. So, how can I find out more about that? Very good. Um, orphanage questions. Uh, the best thing you could do, obviously, I said what we have. Um, usually, every diocese has an organization called Catholic Charities, and they are usually the organization that oversaw um, organizations like orphanages. So. If you're going to Erie Diocese, I would call the Catholic Charities Organization of the Erie Diocese. They might have the records. Sometimes in some cases, religious communities might have records of orphanages, but I think the first thing you should do when dealing diocesan records, call, contact uh, Catholic Charities of each diocese and they might be able to point you directly where those are. Okay, all right. So somebody asked a question actually, and I'm... I'm kind of looking for him um, to unmute him. Hang on just one second. Except I see his hand raised. Hmm. I cannot unmute him though. Well, while um, Sarah or Audrey try to unmute, in the meantime, I'm going to ask, a, uh, ask another question here. So, um, one of our participants asked, my Irish parish merged with two others, an Italian and a German, and all three once had school. My parish had a co-ed grade school and a high school for girls, in addition to sacramental records. Do you, do you have or would you have the educational records in your office? Yes, so as part of our policy, the 2017 records policy, we collect records of closed parishes and closed schools, so you can request uh, educational records. We haven't dealt too much with educational records in regards to genealogy because most school records are still within that era, but you can certainly request your records. And if the records are old enough, we can certainly look to that. Um, in regards to religious communities, I know some religious communities still maintain their school records. I know St. Benedict Academy, they still have their high school records there, but it is certain if it closed, if it was diocesan run, uh, we would have the closed school records here. Okay, all righty. So now here's an interesting question. Um, is there a record that would show new immigrants arriving in the U.S. and first joining a parish? I guess that, you know what I mean? Like that would be it. Do, yeah. do the, um, the parish records show when someone is, um, has newly joined a parish? Uh, regret, I mean, there are, in rare cases, I know St. Pat or St. Stanislaus Koska in the Strip District, we have a parish census from the uh, 1900s, but those are rare. Uh, we don't have too many census books uh, from back then. So regrettably, that's something, if they're immigrants, you're obviously not going to find their baptism here. Um, if they get married here, we can find that record perhaps. But yeah, we don't have it when they joined. We don't have uh, generally speaking, uh, in the rare case, we might have a census book, but that's rare. Okay, Doc. Okay. And then here is someone who asked, my paternal grandparents were married in a Byzantine Catholic church in Clar Clarion. I'm thinking it's Clarion, PA. Um, Assumption Church, she says. Would you have those records? 
we, we do not have ba uh, Byzantine records or any, uh, we have what we consider the Latin rite records. Now there is a, um, the Byzantine eparchy, I believe maintains records on the north side of Pittsburgh. Um, there's a chancery there. That's just something you would have to kind of narrow down um, where the church was and kind of follow the trail of those records. Uh, but we don't have Byzantine records here. Okay, Doc. okay. So um, another question is um, to research parents and grandparents. Um, would I begin with their baptism or marriage certificate? Uh, I mean, or just whatever we can find. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what helped me with um, it depends on where or if you know information. Marriage record is great because if you don't know where they're baptized, it'll often tell us where the person was baptized. So, if you know specifically where they are married, perhaps you could start there, and that might yield the baptismal information or where they're from. But um, where you have, wherever you have your strength, wherever you have the information, that's a good place to be in it. Okay, all righty. Okay, let's see if there's anything else. I do know that there are people who want to ask themselves, but let's see. I don't think, oh yeah, there we go. But now, Linda, oh, I do I hear, had a, I hear things? Yeah, <laughs> Mark had a question earlier and his hand was up. Is that, I think we can go to him here in a second. I will unmute him. If I don't, oh, there, now I see him. Okay. Here, I've got it. So Mark should be able to talk, right? Unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yep, we can. So I did Thank some you, research. Mark. I did some research in Ireland looking for. Um, great great grandparents in the 1850s. And I think it's similar to pictures you're showing of your records, the handwriting of the parish priests. Yeah. I found it was easier to read 1880 than it was 1840. It seems like it was worse, okay. the, the way people wrote. Is, is anyone trying to digitalize any of these records? Um, I know that could be expensive, but is anybody trying? Uh, in regards to Irish records, I know Find My Past is very strong uh, across in Ireland, um, but you get to the, the great crux of the, the point. Uh, our issue is if we digitize, that won't solve the problem of the searches or the, uh, the indexing. So that is something, uh, there are occasionally open source indexers, but uh, in regards to the Irish records, your best resource is a paid source in Find My Past. Um, but there are efforts, but it's an issue of cost sometimes. Um, and an and hour spent, it's an issue, yeah. Yeah, and just if anybody's interested, the, the counties that we went into had a little county hall and there was an archivist or, or a clerk who would be like a part-time archivist and they were very helpful. And they would even draw a hand-drawn map on where a cemetery was. I mean, it was just incredible <laughs> how many individual little towns would have someone who knew something to help uh, travelers or people looking for records. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Thank you. They are very helpful. And I think you, you'd find that about most genealogists as well. They, they want you to be successful. So um, we do have another question and that is um, my grandmothers were baptized at St. Patrick in the former church. We arrived in the 18. 30 in the strip district. So what do they need to provide to find our documents in the 1830s, uh, St. Pat? So, I mean, uh, honestly, there's only two parishes there. So St. Pat, uh, it, you narrowed it down. So we don't have to really do the search of what parish they were at. So we kind of know that that's extremely helpful. Uh, the, if you know the time frame, uh, but even if you're only looking at one parish record, uh, it should be, it should be pretty easy uh, since you narrowed down the work for us that way. But, um, yeah, I mean, early 1800s Pittsburgh, it's really only two parishes. It's either St. Patrick or eventually St. Paul. Um, but um, yeah, if you narrow it down when they were there, uh, I'm certain we can find something for you. Okay, all right. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? I think we've pretty much answered all the questions. Oh, here's Vincent. Does Vincent have a question? Let me just see. Um, 
Hang on, and I'm going to unmute him. I'm going to try to unmute him. Mm. Vincent, can you unmute yourself? How, there we how's go. That? Okay. All right. Go ahead and ask the question. It's, it's huh? going to be my wife, Marianne. Okay. Can I talk now? Okay. Yes. You, you, I'm kind of new to this. I was only at the first session that you did, so I missed the one in between, and I've only gotten back so far. But one thing you did say, Linda, is that don't believe everything you find. So that's been well, the truth. And so my grandparents, who were born in the 1800s, and on some things they were born on in Ireland, some were in England. And then when on my grandfather, when he came and went into the army, then it was marked uh, that he gave up his, um, he was become, oh, when he became an American citizen, he gave up all his rights to citizenship from any other country. And like the, the British crown and the North Ireland, but I'm thinking, and maybe it didn't say anything about Ireland as much as incorporated anybody from Ireland into England. And so I have birth certificates, death certificates, and one time it's Ireland, one time it's England for both of them. So how do I get to that point? Like, would it be better for me to, like right now I'm looking at a death certificate and my grandmother was born in, let's see where, well, this is my who's like, this is my grandmother's and it says she was born in England, but others say Ireland. So what do you think I can do to get a little bit closer to where? <laughs> so you're basically the only information you have is their location is Ireland. No. Okay. No. You have a county then? Or? Nothing. Just okay. says Ireland, England, all the time. Uh, I mean, uh, in regards to my family, uh, Linda might have a better opinion on this. Uh, my grandfather, it says he was born in Russia, but he, he was born in modern day Poland, but it was currently in, a, in a, at the time was considered Russian territory. Mm -hmm. uh, we lucked out because on the, um, the Ellis Island registry, it said where he came from specifically. So we lucked out with that. Uh, I don't know if Linda has more on kind of narrowing down that type of search. Yeah, I think it has to it it, it has to do, I think, with finding additional records, right? And um, what record, it, Linda? Additional. Well, just oh, additional just... records, just to keep searching. There are so many records. I mean, okay. I could I could do you know. Uh, a little bit later to, to see what kind of records that you've looked at. But um, yeah, they're, they're just so many records. And that's the thing I know sometimes, you know, you look at a census record, you know, you've got birth and death certificates, but sometimes that's not enough. You have to dig deeper. And um, thankfully there are a lot of records and records that are digitized, but um, it, it, it's, it's not always easy. They're not always right there. And it just takes some time to, to dig. So, you know, feel free to email me and, I, you know, I can help you pinpoint something like that. But things aren't always necessarily just laid out for you. They so, certainly but are. Get in touch with, yeah, they're not. So good question, though. Okay. Thank you for asking. All right, and I think that we have um, someone else who had a question. I'm looking here to see if there are any hands raised. Mm. Let's see. It looks see. like a couple any... questions came in through the chat, Linda. But, um, hands uh, are yep. down. Scroll down. Um, here's a question. Oh yeah, I saw Beverly's hand up and then she decided to write it in. So was the Diocese of Pittsburgh, this is really a good question, was the Diocese of Pittsburgh once inclusive of Westmoreland County and only later was the Diocese of, of Greensburg created? Absolutely, so yes, at one point we encompassed basically the Western portion of Pennsylvania. We would have incorporated parts of the Erie Diocese as well. 
in the 1950s, uh, it was deemed that the counties of, of Westmoreland, uh, Fayette, Armstrong, and Indiana had a significant amount of Catholic population that a new diocese was created. So that diocese dates only to the, the 1950s. Now, in regards to records, um, people often say, well, in the 30s, it was still the Diocese of Pittsburgh. Would you have these records? No. Um, if it was a Westmoreland County parish, they're all over that direction. So they have parishes older than ours um, around St. Vincent College. Um, they would still have all that information. But yes, the Greensburg Diocese was established in the 1950s. Okay, so she continued and she's asked, so records maybe from the late 1800s and early 1900s would be in Westmoreland County, right? Yeah. Yes, so they would still be in the parishes of Westmoreland County. So again, the older parishes over there are around St. Vincent's um, Blessed uh, Sacrament Cathedral in Greensburg. Um, and you would do the search in those areas for those records. Okay, all righty. And then someone did ask a question about how long ago were census records kept? Um, actually, um, the United States started census records right from the beginning, I think 1790, because they wanted to um, uh, representation, think of representation in Congress. And, um, but the thing is that the different uh, census, so it's every 10 years, right? Just like uh, in 2020, we answered uh, the questions for the census. Um, but they ask different questions at different times. So depending on um, what you're looking for, you may or may not be able to find it in the census records. So, um, and then another question you asked, um, I think it's Carol, what were the ports of entry from Europe, only Ellis Island or Philadelphia? Uh, actually, there were a number of, um, of locations, Baltimore, just off the top of my head. Um, and I can tell you that my family, they came into the United States from Canada because they, um, they left they left England and went um, through Montreal and then uh, stayed in Toronto for a year or so and then came down through um, Buffalo. Um, so not everybody came here right from um, there, I guess came to the United States right from Europe. They might have taken a roundabout way. So um, anybody else? Does anyone else have any other questions or is there anything more that you'd like to ask? or add, um, Dennis? I noticed one question was where we are located, and I meant to say that right away. Uh, the Archives and Records Center, we are presently located in the west end of Pittsburgh. Our address, it's on our website. Um, it is 1050 Logue Street, L-O-G-U-E Street, uh, Pittsburgh, PA 15220. We are actually in the, the former Guardian Angels Church building. So the building I'm in right now is a church building, uh, and you see the white wall behind me. That is our vault. Uh, so it was, it, was, it was fitted out in 2017 as the location. So we've only been here about four years right now. All right, I would love to come visit. All right, so, all right. If there aren't any questions, I think we can um, pretty much um, wrap it up. Audrey, I'm gonna turn it over to you, but Dennis, thank you so much. Always full of a lot of good information. So thank you again, thank Audrey. You, Yes, thank you, Dennis. We really appreciate you taking the time to put together this program for uh, your fellow alumni. And I hope you enjoyed the program as much as we did. I know I learned a lot of uh, really interesting stuff and I can't wait to get searching here. Um, and thank you for taking the time to answer the questions from the audience. I know there's so much information out there to sift through when researching your ancestry. Um, and Linda, thank you for your expertise in moderating the program today. And to our audience, thank you for attending today's Ancestry Exploration event. As we've mentioned in a follow-up email, all um, participants will receive a copy of the recording for this program for your reference. And if you have any follow-up questions for Dennis, um, we'll put his email address in the email. And Linda, is it okay? We'll put yours in there too, just in case. Um, so we hope to see you all again soon at one of our upcoming virtual events. Um, and that's all I've got tonight. So I will say goodbye to everyone and all the best and go Dukes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye.